So before we start the lecture, I wanted to point out the because of this social, it's basically impossible to make a full set of homework out of it. So to be fair to you, to make make sure you get all of the money out of your tuition that you paid, there is gas law homework involved in this week's homework. Okay? So you'll see that when you get to the homework from today, only a few questions are from it, because there's not many different things I can even ask you. But there were so many different types of gas law problems that I couldn't fit it all into one set of homework last week. So some of that is carried over into this week's homework. Okay. The quiz will, as always, be based off of the online homework. So the quiz next week will have gas law questions and questions from today's lecture. Okay. So we talked about gases last week. It seems strange that we had one great big huge long lecture about gases and now we have one really short lecture about liquids and solids. Why do you think that is? Gases are less predictable. Why are they less predictable? They don't have a set shape or volume for density. Exactly. They don't have a set shape. They don't have a dead set volume. The, the volume's a big one, right? Because if you change pressure, you change the volume. If you change temperature, you change the volume, right? And they're all interconnected. If you change the pressure above a liquid or a solid, it makes very, very little difference, right? If you increase the temperature of a liquid or a solid, Yes, we know that when things heat up, they expand. But it's not nearly the same as we see with the gases. With our gases, if we double the temperature of something, what's this volume going to do? Double. It's going to double. If I have a piece of metal, a coin, and I double the temperature of that coin, is that coin going to get twice as big? No. It may get slightly bigger. But it's certainly not going to double. And so it's not a dramatic effect. So we don't really even deal with those types of changes in this class. If you take physics, you'll probably deal with that. There's expansion coefficients where you multiply a constant times a temperature change to get what present the percent of volume change. But we're not going to be dealing with that. We're going to be dealing with solids and liquids. Okay. <coughs> Here we have a solid cat and a liquid cat. Which one is the liquid cat? The one in the bowl. The one in the bowl, why? It's filling its container. It's filling its container, right? Why is this one the solid cat? Why is it a solid cat? It has a definite shape and volume. It has a definite shape. It's stiff, right? It's not conforming to what's underneath it, right? It's a stiff cat. I assume it's alive. I have no reason to believe it's not alive. It's just comfortable. Okay. So looking at this, you immediately knew which one was solid, which one was a liquid. And yes, we talked about solids and liquids, I think, the first week of class. But if I, this was the very first slide you saw in this class, you could have told me which one was a liquid cat and which one was a solid cat. You know that liquids take the form of the container and solids don't. Those are the big differences between solids and liquids. This is sort of a real world level example. Okay. For the rest of the class, we're going to be looking, of course, at the molecular level. What causes this to happen? And what causes one liquid to have a different boiling point than another liquid? Why does one solid have a different melting point than another solid? If you put a glass of water on the desk, and you come back, say, a week later, what's going to happen to the water in that glass? Hopefully it doesn't freeze. Did you say freeze? 
No, I said like the cream. I thought that it was on the best. Oh, I, I, thought, I, I thought you said it would crease. No. <laughs> <laughs> like decrease, like decrease. That, that's what I. Okay. Is that's that what right I heard. Or am I still yeah. wrong? You no, know, you're right. You're right. Oh, you're right. okay. I'm I just couldn't figure out why it's gonna get cold enough for it to freeze. No, here. I said decrease. You never know. <laughs> so, what if you put a lid on that glass? What's gonna happen to the water in that glass? Over the same amount of time, when you come back, what's it going to be like? Okay. It's going to be roughly the same, right? Why? They both sat in the same desk. That's contained. It's contained. So at the molecular level, what do you think happens? Nothing happens. But why? Because it's not mixing. There's no one what do you mean by none of it can evaporate? Because there's a lid cap on it. And what does the lid do it? Sealing. Sealing. Exactly. It's sealing. So you have your glass. You have a little bit of air between the water and the lid. Enough water can evaporate to fill that space up top. But then it hits that lid. Why doesn't all of the water just evaporate to the point that you just have water vapor in your glass. Gases take up a lot more room. Gases take up a lot more room. And we don't have that much room. What happens is we get an equilibrium. We're going to talk about equilibriums in a few different situations in the rest of the semester. This is the first one. In equilibrium, we write with either a double arrow, like that, where you have two, an arrow going right, arrow going left. You may see it written like that. It's the same thing, it's just a one head arrow going each way. You may also see it like that. All means the same thing. So what that means is that this is a two-way process. So in our reactions, we had just that arrow, right? That goes to that. If we say it's an equilibrium, that means the liquid becomes a gas and the gas becomes a liquid. So imagine this is the water in our glass. It starts out, there's water down here, there's no water vapor. You all know that very slowly that water will evaporate. So some of those molecules of water will leave the liquid state and go into the gas state. So here's one, now we've got two, now we've got three, now we've got four, but more time passes and we still have four. We've hit that equilibrium. So when that molecule came from down here to up here, which direction on that reaction are we looking at? Liquid to gas, right? So if we're saying stopped. That means we are at equilibrium. And if it's no longer changing and we're at equilibrium, that means that this process is happening at the same time as that process. It doesn't mean it stopped. Equilibrium never stops. It just means that it's going in both directions at the same rate. So to our eyes, it looks like it stops changing. So in terms of water molecules going from liquid to gas and gas to liquid, what does it mean when we're at equilibrium? Changing at an even rate. Changing at an even rate. And what at the molecular level, what does that mean? The liquids are turning into gas. Exactly. Say every second, I'm just making up time scales here. Say every second, one of these water molecules comes out of the water into the gas. Now imagine we have our, our glass with a lid on it. What do we know about the gas molecules flying around in that container, above the water? They're just staying 
they're not leaving, so, so we don't lose mass, right? Our total amount of water doesn't change. It goes between liquid <coughs> and gas. How in, and in what direction do those gas molecules fly around? Up and down? Right. Randomly. <laughs> randomly is, is the phrase I'm looking for. They fly around randomly. And how fast do they fly? Do they fly slowly or quickly? Hella. Is that slowly or quick? I mean, you could say that it could be either. You could put the adjective in front of either. Quickly. Quickly. Okay. So you have gas molecules flying around really quickly, right? Hella fast. What happens when they go up? What do they hit? They hit the lid. What happens when they go sideways? They hit the side. What happens when they go down? They hit the water. What do you think happens when a gas, uh, H2O gas molecule hits the water? It joins the water. It goes from gas into the liquid. So we said every second one of these liquid molecules is coming up into the gas, but then they're flying around up here. And so by pure chance, every second, one of these hits the water, the liquid water, and goes into the liquid. So to our eyes, the amount of liquid and the amount of gas is no longer changing. But the specific independent molecules are constantly going back and forth. So if we label these molecules 1 through 10, at any given time, let's say three of them are in the or let's say four of them are in the gas phase. It could be one through four. It could be one, two, five, and six. It could be any of them. But at any given time, four of them are up here, and six of them are down here. That's our equilibrium. Yeah. So then why, if they're at the same temperature, don't all of them do that? Why, why are some a gas and some a liquid at all? Because they're capped. Because it's capped, then you get they get stuck up here, and so you, you hit equilibrium so that they hit down here. They all want to be a gas, and we'll, we'll see that maybe the next slide. So you know, if you take that lid off, they're all going to become a gas, right? It's all going to evaporate. So if you leave a like, big glass of water out for so long, it'll eventually yeah, not, I mean, the it, water won't be there anymore? No. It, it, if, if you spill a little water and you leave and come back the next day, it's going to be gone, right? Yeah. It's going to evaporate. If you had a whole jug of water and you let it sit there, it's going to evaporate. If you have a lake and it, you don't get enough rain, the whole lake dries up, okay? pressure of the gas above that water when it's at equilibrium is called the vapor pressure. Okay, so what is the relationship between the amount of gas up here and pressure? Force of air. Looking for more for general, thinking about what we talked about last week. How does the amount of a gas relate to pressure? If you increase the amount, what happens to pressure? It increases. It increases. It's constant. Right? So here, we have no gas up here. What do you think our vapor pressure is? Zero. Zero. There's no gas, so we have no pressure. As we go from one to two, three to four molecules of gas, what's happening to our pressure? It's increasing. We hit equilibrium and we stopped here. So we're just going to say this is a vapor pressure of 1, 2, 3, and 4. So it's in this case, at this temperature, this means that water has a vapor pressure of 4. If we heated this glass, we kept it capped, and we heated it, the temperature, the vapor pressure is going to change. What happens to water when you, when you heat it up? It evaporates, right? Heating water makes it want to be a gas. You know that. 
if you heat liquid water, it makes it want to become a gas. So if we take this sample, even if it's kept, and we heat it, all we do is we shift our equilibrium. More of it goes from liquid to gas. So then maybe we'll have six molecules of gas up here. This is a vapor pressure graph. You won't have to do too much with this, but it's not that difficult when you really break it down. So on the x-axis, we have temperature, and it's in degrees Celsius. Okay? We, on it, we have three curves, three different compounds. We have water, methanol, and methane. On the y-axis is vapor pressure. So the way you read this is say, let's look at water. Say we have water at 100, degree, 100 degrees Celsius. You go up till you hit the line, and then you go over and you read it, and it's one atmosphere. The vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees Celsius is one atmosphere. So if you have your glass with a cap on it, and you heat it, to 100 degrees Celsius, the pressure of the water vapor gas above the liquid will be one atmosphere. The liquid will continue to evaporate until you have enough gas to give you one atmosphere of pressure. So what can you say about the vapor pressure of methane compared to water? Temperature is less. So if you look at with the one atmosphere, across the one atmosphere, to get one atmosphere vapor pressure for methane, you need, that looks like it's about 100, negative 160. Whereas water, you need positive 100 degrees. You know at room temperature, is methane a solid, liquid, or a gas? It's a gas. Okay. So room temperature is about 20 degrees. Where do you think this line is when it gets far enough over to cross 20 degrees? It's really way up there, right? Which means it's going to keep going from liquid to gas over and over and over again until it hits that mark. But it's never going to hit that mark. There isn't enough methane in the world to hit that mark. So all of it becomes a gas. It does the best that it can. And so all of it's a gas at room temperature. The boiling point is the point at which the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So what is the boiling point of water? 212 Fahrenheit. In Celsius. 100 Celsius. And what did we say in atmospheres is, in general, the atmospheric pressure? One. So we look at our water curve at 100 degrees Celsius. You go up to atmospheric pressure. It's one atmosphere. The boiling point is the temperature in which the vapor pressure is the same as the atmospheric temperature. Sorry, the atmospheric pressure. Coming back to our methane, what would you say is the boiling point of methane? Negative one sixty. Negative one sixty. Now let's look at another one. Let's go back to our water and say we pressurize our system. We're no longer just out in the open atmosphere. We're in a closed container that we can pressurize. If we pressurize it, the two atmospheres of pressure, now what is the boiling point of water? You go up to two atmospheres, 
So you hit the line, go down, you're at 120. So you can read this graph in two different ways. You can say, if I know my temperature, what is my vapor pressure? Or if you know your, the atmospheric pressure, you can say, what is the boiling point of my liquid at that temperature? So in general, as pressure goes up, does boiling point go up or down? Up. Up. Okay. So, does anyone, has anyone lived in Colorado or in the mountains or anything? Has anyone ever noticed on the box of brownies that says, high altitudes follow these instructions? You ever seen that? Do you know what those instructions are? What's different about them? You know, isn't the higher the altitude, the, is it higher pressure or lower pressure? The higher, higher altitude, pressure. Has, what, what, what's the difference of the pressure and the high altitude? The higher or lower? Yeah, air pressure is lower up, up high. So if the air pressure is lower up high, what's the boiling point of water on top of a mountain? Is it higher or lower than 100? It's less. So if you're cooking something that has water in it, it's not going to actually get as hot up on top of the mountain as down at sea level. So you have to cook it longer. because. If you set your oven to 400 degrees, maybe your brownies aren't going to get to 400 degrees. So you're only going to get 350. And so they're going to have to cook them at 350 longer to top of the mountain. What causes these differences? If we look at these, we have water, methanol, and methane. Why are these so different? I mean, looking at those four molecules, Sorry, three. I, I can count, believe it or not. There are three. Which two look most similar to you? Just in terms of the formula. The water and the other one? The other one? The CH3. So y you say methane and methanol. You seem to say water and what? Well, I was just looking at the, because those two are like yeah. CH4 is more vertical, so I'd say it's the optimal. That's my reason. Yeah. The pressure uh, shoots up more vertically as opposed to the other two. Yeah. The only difference between methane and methanol is one oxygen. Yeah. So if we just if we if we ignore the graph, if we just look at CH4, uh, CH3OH, and H2O, which two look most similar? CH4 and CH3OH. CH4 and CH3OH. Like you said, the only difference is an oxygen. So why on earth are these two so far apart? And these two are actually kind of close. It's not magic. It's, not magic. <laughs> <laughs> it's inter intermolecular forces. Okay. So intermolecular forces, remember when we talked about what makes an ideal gas, and we said there are no attractions between molecules. They fly around like they don't even know they're there until they hit each other. They bounce off each other, but they don't have attraction, they don't have repulsion. They don't like bend around each other as they fly. They just kind of go in a straight line. In liquids and gases, sorry, liquids and solids, there are intermolecular forces. The molecules of the same type next to each other are attracted to each other. And to get a solid to melt, you have to put in enough energy to break that attraction. Because how, what do the atoms look like, or the, what do the molecules look like in a solid? How do they move? How do they move, and how close together are they? They don't move. How close together are they? Not very close. They're very close, right? When you go from a solid to a liquid, what change happens at the molecular level in terms of distance and movement? They move more. They, move more. they, they start moving, and they move a little bit further apart. So if they are attracted to each other, you're going to have to break that attraction in order to get them to come apart and then start moving. That's why you have to heat something to get it to melt. The same thing happens when you evaporate something. When they're in liquids, yes, they're moving and they're a little bit further apart, but compared to a gas, they're hardly moving and they're still really close. So to get them to go from a liquid to a gas, you have to put more heat in 
to break, break those attractions even more. You have to heat something to make it boil, to make it evaporate. So this, when we look at the molecular scale, can tell us why carbon dioxide is a gas at room temperature and water is a liquid. Intermolecular forces. And why do different liquids have different boiling points? Intermolecular forces. What causes molecules to stick together when they're in liquid state? Everybody. Intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces. These are attractive forces. We're not going to deal with repulsive forces. In that situation, you're going to have two different compounds mixed together. Maybe one that's negatively charged, one that's positively charged. We're just be going to be dealing with pure substances. So all the molecules in your container are the same thing. They're, they're, they're all either positive, they're all negative, they're all neutral, okay? So these are the forces that exist between molecules, not between atoms in a molecule. They are not going back to ionic and covalent bonds. These are different forces that are between molecules. There are three types. <coughs> London dispersion forces. We're going to call them London dispersion forces. If you look it up online or in a different textbook, they may be called van der Waals forces. It's German or Dutch or something. You may see that. There, he's the guy that discovered them. So you may see one or the other. We're going to use London dispersion forces. And then there are dipole-dipole forces and hydrogen bonding. Yeah. And as you go down this list, they get stronger. So we're going to take a, a better look at each of them. So this is London dispersion forces. These are the most common. Unfortunately, at the conceptual level, they're the most difficult to understand. But luckily, if you don't understand them conceptually, you can still get by and figure out the trend of how strong they are. But if you can figure it out conceptually, it's going to help you. Okay. So remember we talked about electron clouds. And so around our nucleus, we have electron clouds, where the electrons are randomly flying around. So in this example, we have two atoms that are the same in every way. Okay? Pick, pick your favorite element. There are two elements, two atoms of it. In a perfect world, the electron clouds are perfectly spherical. And on, an, on average, if you take a big chunk of time, on average, that electron cloud is going to be a perfect sphere. But they move around randomly. So at any given point in time, it's possible that there are more electrons on one side than the other. Does anybody have a little rodent pet? Like a hamster? Like a hamster. I need to. Okay. Imagine I have 100 hamsters, okay. and I let them loose in the center of the room. Okay? They're probably going to run around randomly. Just run around like crazy. On average, they're going to be equally spread out through the room. But at any given point in time, it's possible that maybe 60 of them will be over here, and only 40 of them will be over here. See what I mean by over time, it's possible at one point in time, they may be lopsided. But in general, they're going to be equally spread out. Now imagine your hamsters are negatively charged, like an electron. Electrons are negatively charged. What happens if all of a sudden we have 60 negatively charged hamsters over here and 40 negatively charged hamsters over here? It's not balanced. It's not balanced. And so if we look at our electron cloud, 
it can get distorted. So in this case, we have more electrons on this side than on that side at one instant in time. And the more distorted it gets, eventually we get these partial charges. Remember in our, co in our polar covalent bond, we had partial charges. We can actually get a partial charge on an atom just based off the random movement of electrons. So now imagine this happens on two, on both atoms. So now they both have a partial positive and a partial negative, but if they're arranged in a way that the partial negative on this one is next to the partial positive on that one, all of a sudden there's attraction between them. It's very short-lived because the next nanosecond later, it probably is going to flip over. But in a sample of a compound, we have so many atoms that a portion of them at any given point in time are going to be oriented like this. So there's going to be some attraction between those atoms. So if I have a million beryllium atoms, there is no reason for those beryllium atoms to be attracted to each other other than this. If these are two beryllium atoms, there's no reason for them to be attracted to each other. But through a fluke of statistics, if at any point in time they look like this, there's going to be attraction. <coughs> because this is random, and it all it depends on is electrons, every atom has electrons. So every compound has London dispersion forces. There is not a substance in the world that doesn't have London dispersion forces. In a nonpolar substance, it is the only attractive force. So, I think on the previous slide, we listed three of them. If you have a nonpolar compound, London dispersion forces are the only intermolecular forces present. And this is what we're talking about is the temporary distortion of our electron. Now imagine we have 100 hamsters, okay? What's the most polar we can get? What's the most hamsters that can be over on this side? 100. What's the least hamsters that can be over on this side? Yeah. Can't have negative hamsters, sorry. So what's the, what's the difference in the number of hamsters between this side and that side? 100. 100. Now, let's say instead of having 100 hamsters, we had 200 hamsters. What's the least number of hamsters I can have on this side? Yeah. Zero. And what's the most I can have over here now? 200. 200. So now what's the difference between that side and this side? 200. 200. So the more hamsters, or the more electrons that you have, the larger the difference you can have. Right? So the more electrons that you have, in your atoms, the larger your electron cloud can get distorted. And the more it's distorted, the stronger your partial positive, partial negative, the stronger your attraction. So when you boil it all down, it's basically the more electrons you have in your atoms or in your molecules, is it a stronger or weaker London dispersion force? Stronger. Thing. And if you want to simplify it even further, rather than counting electrons, you can go by molecular or molar mass. So if you have a compound, here we have three compounds, we want to figure out which one has the strongest London dispersion force. All you have to do is look at the periodic table. You have chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Which one's heaviest? Iodine. So which one has the strongest London dispersion forces? Iodine. Iodine. Now use that fact to explain to me what this picture is showing. Iodine is so attracted to each 
each other it became solid and bond? Is that what that is? Let me set the table for you then. In each of them, we put a chunk of solid chlorine, a chunk of solid bromine, a chunk of solid iodine, and then, and then waited, and you said you saw that. Oh, so it stayed solid. Right, it stayed solid. It didn't become solid. The chlorine solid completely became a gas. It looks like there might be a little bit of bromine in here that's still, that looks like a liquid. And then the iodine, most of it's still in the solid form. Iodine has the strongest attraction. If you have one I2 here and another one here, they're attracted to each other. They don't want to leave and break apart and become a gas. So the stronger London dispersion forces are holding the iodine in a solid. The bromine London dispersion forces are a little bit weaker. So we have more in the gas, and in the bottom, instead of having a solid, we have a liquid. And then the chlorine, the London dispersion forces are so weak that it all became a gas. So, which one has the higher melting point? Which one of the three? Iodine. Iodine. Which one has the highest boiling point? Iodine. Iodine. The stronger the London dispersion forces, the more heat you have to put into it. The higher you have to raise the temperature to make it go to a different state of matter, to go from a solid to a liquid, to go from a liquid to a gas. So this is the type of a problem that you would deal with. Given two or maybe more compounds or elements, which one has a stronger London dispersion force? So helium or krypton, which one has stronger London dispersion force? Krypton. Krypton, why? It's heavier. Which one has the higher boiling point? Krypton. HCl or HBr? Which one has higher London dispersion forces? HBr. Why? It's heavier. It doesn't matter at this point that it's not a compound. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's a single element, a diatomic element, or a compound. Find the molecular weight. Whichever one is higher has stronger London dispersion forces. CH4 or C2H6, which one is higher? C2H6. C2H6, which one has the lower melting point? CH4. <coughs> CH4. Make sure when you get to these problems, they're easy. The hardest part is making sure you don't buzz through the question and assume the question says which one is higher. Okay? So why did H2O have a higher melting point than methanol? And methanol is CH3. Because there are three types of intermolecular forces. And the London dispersion forces are the weakest of them all. So that they're going to get overpowered by the other ones. So we should be wrong for right on the base. Depending on the other two. The other two. Well, at the end, once we talk about all three, it will start comparing compounds that have different forces. CH4 or SiH4? Which one's higher? SiH4. The silicon is heavier than carbon, so this is heavier than that. This isn't hard, right? The second type of force are dipole, dipole attraction. This comes back to that whole polar or nonpolar molecule thing. Is this molecule polar or nonpolar? Polar. It's polar. Right? So here we have the partial positive and the partial negative in a molecule. In this case, it's not due to random movements of electrons. This is because the red elements have higher or lower electronegativity than the yellow ones. Higher. Electronegativity is a measure of the attraction to electrons, how strong the element pulls in electrons. Fluorine, in the top right corner, is the most electronegative. So in this case, because the red ones 
are more electronegative. The electron cloud is permanently pulled this way. And in this element, this molecule is permanently pulled this way again. Which means that we permanently have a partial negative next to a partial positive. So again, we have the attraction between partial positive and partial negative, but in this case, permanent. So we talked about with our beryllium, only a tiny fraction of those atoms in there at any point in time are actually attracted to each other. In this case, all of the molecules are always attracted to the other molecules around them. So it's the same type of force, it's just that all of the molecules are participating at the same time. So a dipole-dipole force is stronger in a sample than the London dispersion forces. It's called dipole-dipole because this partial negative, another word for that, is called a dipole. So this, here's a dipole, there's a dipole, so this is a dipole-dipole force. If you have a polar molecule, you will have dipole-dipole forces. There's no way around it. But if you have a polar molecule, you also have London dispersion forces. Remember that everything is London dispersion forces. The next step is, is my molecule polar or nonpolar? If it's nonpolar, all you have are London dispersion forces. If your molecule is polar, you have London dispersion and dipole-dipole. This is SO2. It has dipole-dipole and London dispersion forces. Does A, does A have dipole-dipole forces? Yes. Why? Because we just did it. Yeah. Why us? It's, 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 it has a dipole. It's a polar molecule. You can look at that and say, clearly, there are more reds on that side than that side. That's a polar molecule. It's asymmetrical. So that's polar. And if it's polar, by default, it has dipole-dipole forces. Does that have dipole-dipole forces? Yes, why? Because it's two things. What do you mean by two things? You get a horizontal, it's not symmetrical. Right. If you, if you draw a line through that, you have green ones on the bottom, white ones on the top. That's not symmetrical. That's a polar molecule. What about C? Does that have dipole dipole forces? Yes. Yes. It's drawn a little bit tricky, but in what way is it polar? I guess it's a trigonal pyramidal. It's trigonal pyramidal. These green ones are angled down a little bit. It would have been easier if they had chosen smaller molecules and put them down here. What about D? Does that have dipole dipole forces? No. No. It's, remember, it has polar bonds but they cancel each other out. It's symmetrical. And so that one does not have dipole-dipole forces. Which ones have London dispersion forces? All of them. All of them. Everything has London dispersion forces. These three were polar, so they have dipole-dipole. That one was non-polar, so it does not have dipole-dipole. On D there, I know I brought this up before, I don't quite remember what you said, if you cut that horizontally, there would still be two molecules on top and one on the bottom. Even though they all cancel each other out, if they were oriented a certain way, they could be polar. If you cut it directly in half, there would be enough of the top ones on the it bottom to half. Yeah, yeah. I'm not good enough to, I'm not good enough to draw any, but we'll try. Because 
No, if I try to draw that, that's going to prove your point, which is not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, if you if you draw a line through the middle, you get a little bit. You cut a little bit of each of these off. You would have this one plus a little bit of these. Or even even ignoring the line thing, just imagine two of the molecules lined up in that way, where two are on this side, one on this side, another molecule lined up, one pointing towards the other, two pointing to the outside. But within within the one molecule, it's symmetrical, so you're not going to have a dipole. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're gonna what is it? This is the yeah. Which one is more electronegative? The boron or the fluorine? The fluorine. So when each bond, in isolation, you would have like that, right? But this fluorine has some attraction to these electrons. So it pulls these electrons a little bit further back. And it pulls these a little bit up. And this one pulls these a little bit back. And it all cancels out, and the electrons end up exactly where they're supposed to be. And so overall, there is no charge. So an ionic bond is a completely polar bond. So when we talk about the polarity of bonds, Remember, it had to do with the difference in electronegativity. It's the strength that that element is pulling on the electron. And so if we have carbon and nitrogen, and then carbon and fluorine, which one is the more polar bond? Carbon and fluorine, why? They're further apart in the periodic table, which means they have <coughs> more different Electronegativities. So the fluorine can pull on that electron harder than the nitrogen can. Okay? And so it gets that electron closer and closer to it as their electronegativity difference goes up. What's the difference between a covalent bond and an ionic bond? Metals. Metals. At the, at, at the electron level. What's the difference between an ionic bond and a covalent bond? The electrons are shared. In a covalent bond, the electrons are shared. In ionic bonds, they're taken, right? So let's say Andrew and I are friends, and we have an electron that we're going to share, OK? But Andrew is kind of the mean friend, OK? So he's going to say, yeah, we're going to share it, but I'm going to keep it in my house. OK? So that's sort of what an ionic bond is like. It's shared so, so unequally that it's his. OK? I may be able to say it's mine, but if I ask to see it, he's not going to let me see it. Right? So an ionic bond is basically a completely polar bond. He pulls on it so strongly that I can't get it back no matter how much I want. Okay. So an ionic compound has the strongest dipole forces, meaning ionic compounds have the highest melting temperatures. And so if you have a larger charge difference, you have a stronger force. So if we take this and we'll compare it to, to ionic compounds, which of these two ionic compounds has the stronger attractive force between them? MGL. Why MGL? Because of the electron charges. What about the atoms, the atomic charges? Mg and O both have plus two and negative two, and they and Cl have plus one negative two. Right. So if we go MgO, NaCl, this magnesium ion is 2 plus, the oxygen ion is 
2 minus, the sodium is 1 plus, the chlorine is 1 minus. So what is the difference between these two numbers? How far apart are these two numbers on a number one? Four. Four. So what's the difference between these two numbers? Two. Two. These are further apart, so there's stronger, a larger charge difference, so you get a stronger force. So which one has the lower melting point? MgO or NaCl? NaCl. Weaker force comes from smaller charge difference leads to lower melting point. It's easier to melt it. You don't have to put in as much heat. Third type of intermolecular force is hydrogen bond. And this comes back to the water. Water is wacky. Okay? When you look at boiling points for different compounds, every once in a while you hit one that just doesn't fit in. It just it's really hot, and there's no good reason why. It's a really it's a light molecule, so it shouldn't have strong London dispersion forces. Sometimes it's even nonpolar. So it doesn't have, sorry, no. It can have low London dispersion force. It can be very small, but it takes a lot of energy to heat it in order to get it to evaporate or melt. You have to put a lot of heat into it. But it just doesn't make sense. It's because of this hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is only between molecules that contain hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Those are your three things. Hydrogen bound to a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. The hydrogen bound to anything else will not have hydrogen bonding. So you'll have NH, OH, or FH. Always. And these hydrogen bonds are really strong. They're the strongest intermolecular forces around. And so, because they're so strong, it makes the compounds that have them have really high boiling points, like water. Which of these does water have? And OH. And there's two hydrogens, both bond to an oxygen. So you get kind of a, a double double hydrogen bond. You get two for your money. Okay. Is anybody who's taking biology? What did you talk about with hydrogen bonds that basically makes life possible? Anybody know? I suppose, yeah. Yeah, I guess. What I was going for DNA. What is the structure of DNA? Three dimensional structure. Double helix. Double helix. Everybody knows double helix, right? It's the, supposed to be the bridge over 13th Street, but it's not actually a double helix. So it's basically, imagine this is a pearl, okay? But it's not, right? So in a double helix you have, it's like a twisted lap, right? And on each strand, there are the A, T, C's, and G's. There's four bases in DNA. And the way they fit together is that this base is hydrogen bound to that base. And that one is bound to that one. And that one's bound to that one. And so there's a very strong attraction between them. So it holds them together really well. But a hydrogen bond isn't permanent. That base is permanently bound to that base. There's a covalent bond between them. Why is it important that that strand is reversibly held together to that strand? Why is it important that you can take them apart? So you can replicate DNA everywhere? 
Right. In, in order to replicate DNA, you have to take the two strands apart. Every time a cell in your body divides, it has to copy its DNA. If these two are stuck together, it can't pull apart. Some chemotherapeutics, what they do is they covalently link those two strands together. So in that case, the cancer cells can't pull their DNA apart, they can't replicate the DNA and they die. So this is what hydrogen bonding looks like. This is water. Of the three, of these three, we said water has hydrogen and oxygen bound together. So here, the oxygen on this one is sort of bound to the hydrogen on that one. Hydrogen here is bound to that oxygen. And this oxygen is bound to hydrogen on the waters around it. Ammonia in water. Even though water has H bound to O, and ammonia has H bound to N, they can still hydrogen bond to each other. Anytime you have the hydrogen and the oxygens, they can bond together, and this nitrogen is going to bind to a hydrogen in one of the waters. You're also going to have the ammonias binding to another ammonia, just like this. So if we have just ammonia by itself, you still get hydrogen bonding. This is hydrogen fluoride. This is an HF bond. This one's easier because there's just two, and you get this kind of alternating pattern where the hydrogen is next to the fluorine, and that the hydrogen on that fluorine is next to the fluorine on the next one. They orient themselves so that you get this hydrogen bond. This is the DNA we're talking about. So in DNA, you have A, T, Cs, and Gs. The Cs in the G's always go opposite of each other. In the A's and the T's always go opposite of each other. And that's because C's and G's have two hydrogen bonds. The A's and the T's have three. So if you take one of these and try to match it with that one, they're not going to fit together. That's why you always get the A's and the T's in the C's and the G's. So, with this compound, have hydrogen bonding. Yes. yes. Why yes? It has, it has hydrogen and nitrogen, right? It's important to notice whether the hydrogen is bound directly to the nitrogen. If that wasn't there, you had CH3N, would that have hydrogen bonding? No. No, because the hydrogens are bound to the carbon, and the nitrogen is bound to the carbon, but there is no hydrogen on the nitrogen itself. Hydrogen bonding? No. 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 There isn't even a hydrogen in there. Hydrogen bonding? Yes. Yeah. No. No. Wait, no, sorry. No. There's hydrogen and, and an oxygen, but these hydrogens are on that carbon, these hydrogens are on that carbon, and the oxygen does not have a hydrogen. Hydrogen bonding? Yes. Hydrogen bonding? No. No. So, when we start classifying which types of molecules have which forces, you work your way out. Okay? Everything has sudden dispersion forces, okay? If it's nonpolar, it'll only have London dispersion forces. If you're polar, you, by default, have dipole-dipole forces. If you're polar and you have an HF, an HO, or an HN, you have hydrogen bonds. If you have hydrogen bonds, you immediately have dipole dipole and London. If you have polar, if you have dipole dipole, you immediately have London. Okay. So here we have two compounds. 
We're going to have to figure out which types of hoses they both have and figure out which one has the higher milk. So we have CO and HI. Which one has stronger intermolecular force? Why HF? Because of hydrogen bonds. Right. So but between the two, which ones have one dispersion force? They, they, they both do, right? Which one has a higher London dispersion force? Which one is stronger? HF. HF. So HF, I think CO is going to be heavier. If you add 12 and 16, you get more than what is it, 19, 18 and 1. So CO is heavier. But in this case, it doesn't matter whether that CO is heavier because there are bigger fish to fry here. That weight difference only matters if you're only dealing with London dispersion forces in both of them. Which ones have dipole, dipole forces? Both of them. Both of them. They're both polar. So they both have dipole dipole. So if neither of them has one has hydrogen bonding, then we have to figure out which one has stronger dipole dipole forces. But before we go through that work, which ones have hydrogen bonding? HF does. If one has hydrogen bonding and the other one does not, it doesn't matter about what, how the difference in the dispersion force is. It doesn't matter the difference in dipole-dipole. Hydrogen bonding always wins. So HF has stronger intermolecular forces. Which one has the higher melting point? HF. Which one has the higher boiling point? HF. Here's a couple more. Which one has the highest boiling point? Why CH3OH? Because it's hydrogen bonding. It has hydrogen bonding. So here we have an OH. SH, in my mind, looks like it should be hydrogen bonding. I mean, S is right below O, so they should behave similarly. But SH does not hydrogen bond. Which one has the higher boiling point? CAS. Why CAS? It's polar. It's polar. Which one, of the two, which one has London dispersion? Both. Both. Which one has dipole dipole? CAS. CAS. P6, they're all the same element. So it, no matter what <coughs> way you draw that, whatever shape you put that in, if you don't have polar bond, you can't have polar bond. So because they're all the same element, it's immediately nonpolar. And if it's nonpolar, you don't have dipole dipole. Do either of them have hydrogen bonding? Yes. No. So because this one has dipole dipole and London, this one is stronger, it has a higher boiling point. What about CO and N2? Which one has a higher boiling point? CO. CO. Do either of them have hydrogen bonding? No. Do either of them have dipole dipole? Yes. yes. CO it's polar, it has dipole, dipole. N2 is non-polar. It only has one. So, in summary, with London dispersion forces, the larger your molecules, the stronger the force. In dipole, dipole, the larger the charge difference, the stronger the force. And if you have hydrogen bonding, because you have OH, NH, or HF, you immediately win. Okay? You're going to see all three of these again. Okay? You can't just think hydrogen is stronger than dipole, dipole is stronger than London dispersion. Remember this and this. Okay. That's the end of the lecture. Let's take a, we're going to get out of here early, so we're just going to do a five minute break. Okay, so let's come, well, let's do maybe six. At ten after on that clock. Six minutes and seven seconds.
if it was say what barges? There actually was one of one of those examples in here. I took it out because it just confuses everyone. Yeah. Because there is, I don't remember what it was. It was, I it was I two, so it was just one. Yeah. But it was really really massive. You know, two iodines together, heavy. And I think the other one was like carbon monoxide. So it had dipole dark, but it's a very rare light. Yeah, I just, uh, just put up my glasses because I, uh, I feel like I'm wearing man in my glasses. Oh, I, so I got weird. Coke bottles too. That's why I don't so wear them. Weird. I got the Coke bottles. You know them Coke bottles in the Y'all won't see them. I'm going to wear these contacts every day. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's just the weirdest feeling now because I've never had glasses before, so I feel like I'm like way taller than I am when I'm wearing them. <laughs> I don't know. In this case, because the specific heat has three Celsius, you can use the Celsius. So what is the temperature change between 10 and 25? 15. So you can just put 15 degrees Celsius. In gas. In gas. Number one. It's now more difficult because a lot of conversions. So it's the same equation. So, if 165 pounds, you have to convert that to grams. 262 calories with a capital C, convert it to joules. And you're given C, so now you have delta H, you have M, 